Linda, I think we have one more minute and then we will start right away. Fantastic. I'm ready. You are always ready. Oh, not always. <laughs> <laughs> All right, for the sake of every, respecting everybody's time, I'm gonna get us started. So hello to everybody, I'm Gail Lutz and I am pleased to welcome you to this week's edition of Let's Talk. Let's Talk is a weekly program that discusses topics in finance, business, career, and health and wellness, specifically designed for professional women. And for any of you men who have joined us today, we welcome you as well. So I am pleased to welcome Linda Nash, founder and CEO of Welcome MD as our featured speaker today. Over the next 45 minutes or so, Linda is going to share her insights on successfully managing through the challenges of leading a healthcare system in today's unusual environment. Welcome MD is the fourth company that Linda has founded and I think you're gonna find her background and her insights helpful and inspirational. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A symbol on the bottom of your screen. So let's begin. Linda, you are frequently described as a serial entrepreneur. I believe you began your career in education. So can you talk about your career journey? Sure. I um, started out with not a straight journey at all. Um, many, many twists and turns. It, this was not a focus, this is where I'm going to be at this stage of my life at all. So it wasn't um, planned, but I started as a journalist, then I became a teacher, and then the entrepreneurial gene really kicked in. Um, I'm from a family business. It's called Track and Field News. It's still around today, believe it or not. And we were taking a lot of people to the Olympic Games until that got postponed due to COVID. Um, but the whole point that I learned with this is that being a part of this business that my dad created, I watched him get up every day doing something he was passionate about and working with people in the field that he respected and cared about. And he was very, very happy in his work. And I think that gave me that gene and that sort of ability to push myself to start my own business. So I started with childcare. I had workplace childcare centers in Virginia, um, five of them here and in Northern Virginia, did that for quite a while and sold that to a public company. And then I formed the Compass School, the logo is there, and I um, enjoyed doing that because it was more of a um, Italian curriculum, more of a challenge, I sold that my portion of that. And then I wanted a real demographic shift. So I was looking around for the next thing to do, was very briefly um, thrown from a horse at a camp where my children were, ended up in the hospital, couldn't reach my doctor. And while I was lying in the hallway, hoping to be admitted when they would not cut the Bozeman, Montana folks off at the front desk, I was thinking there's got to be a better way. So I had been thinking about customer service and healthcare for a long time, and I really was at the right place at the right time. It was just the dawn of concierge medicine. When we started, people looked at us like we had three heads, but we went and did it anyway. And um, at first, there was a lot of controversy as to whether Congress and the federal government were even going to let it go through, but they did. And now it is a very solid part of the healthcare scene and even more so. So I started Partner MD in 2002 with 40 patients. And when I left, I had 10,000 clients, 30 plus physicians, 13 locations coast to coast. I sold it to Markel Ventures in 2011 and then left in 2015. 
um, not because Markel isn't a fantastic company and they're doing a wonderful job with Partner MD, but I really wanted to do my own thing and start another company one more time. So I had learned a lot and thought a lot about concierge, which is my real passion, this kind of healthcare. And so I wanted to start Welcome, and that's where I am now. So Linda, I know you very well, and we've, we've uh, been friends for quite a while. You mentioned uh, you wanted to do start another company one more time. My guess is this is not going to be your last road. <laughs> either knowing you. No, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Well, I, I, can't, I can't see uh, just uh, retiring. I'm just not ready. <laughs> no, you're not. No, you're not. So part are you? <laughs> no, no. So Partner MD um, and Welcome MD are considered concierge medical practices, um, but they're different. They're different and yet they're similar. So what I'd like you to do is talk a little bit about the differences and the similarities um, in, in focus and approach and benefits. Absolutely. Um, I guess the biggest difference is I see Welcome MD as the next generation, generation 2.0 of personalized medicine. I didn't want to just do a partner MD down the street. They do that very, very well. I wanted to figure out what people were looking for after concierge had evolved from where it got started in the early 2000s and to see what people wanted now in 2018, 19, 20. So we have a bunch of unique features that we do and I'm really proud of them. One of them is our DNA fitness and nutrition testing where we look at stress, sleep, through your genes. It's a one-time test and it tells you things like how you react to carbs, how you react to different stresses in your life, what type of workout you do best. In other words, should you do a sprint? Should you do a long distance run? How do you recover from things? And all of this then is paired with really extensive curated labs and we get a plan for being the best that you can be. The, um, we have the anti-aging functional focus, so we put that together with information on hormones, stress levels, deep, deep understanding of inflammatory markers, and all of this kind of ties together. And in my opinion, and I'm reading so much more about this with COVID, really helps with your immune system. Now that's not a free pass that you won't get sick, but the fitter you are, the better you eat, the more you understand your labs and your risk factors, the less risk factors you have, like prediabetes, hypertension, all of these help your immune system and help you stay healthy in these very perilous times. Um, and then the other really fun thing for me is that with my partner, Dr. Neil Carl, the medical director and his leadership, we are always looking for the next thing to, to try and to work with our patients on. So one of the things we're looking at are peptides, which are amino acids that are really important in inflammation, in anti-aging, in a lot of different things. They've been studied extensively and we are beginning with some people, they're very, very um, non-invasive. They're almost like a vitamin or a supplement. And we're beginning to talk to some of our clients about, about that. So that's just one example. But for me, it keeps it fresh and interesting because there is so much new on the anti-aging functional front. And really, it's optimal aging. But you have to think about how do we all want to age? I don't want to live to 100 if I'm in a wheelchair or in a bed, unable to enjoy my life. What I want to do is live as long as I can with the 
optimal feeling of being able to hike, being able to dance, being able to golf, being able to do whatever it is that, that interests me. And I know other people want to too. So there's a distinction between living long and living well. So Linda, um, how many um, locations does uh, Welcome MD have? We have two right now. Um, we have three physicians in Richmond in the West End, and then we have a new office we opened in October in Charlotte, and okay. we're hoping to add another physician there soon, and it's been going extremely well. Charlotte is a dynamic market, and I'm really excited to be there, and I was traveling there quite often, getting to know it <laughs> until all of this happened, and I will be back as soon as I can. <laughs> so Linda, if I understand the, the, um, the model for Welcome MD completely or correctly, so uh, you do the DNA testing, mm -hmm. and it kind of gives um, the physician a blueprint on, on how to optimize your health right. um, based on a variety of factors. Um, what kind of follow-up is done? How often is it done? Um, and, and do you partner ever with fitness centers and trainers and how do you tie all that together? That's a great question. We look at this and we set a goal driven by the doctor, but we also have participants in that. We have a functional nutritionist that looks at the labs in terms of diet and recommends goals. We have a physical therapist, exercise physiologist, who helps talk about balance and the way that you move and gives you recommendations for both exercises and ways to avoid injuries. Because once we get stiff or imbalanced in a certain area, the older we get, the more we can be injury prone. So we put that all together. And then because our ratios are so different, normal concierge is 600 patients, which isn't that many, but it's really a lot when you're taking this kind of care of them. Ours is 300. So we have, it's, it's like a classroom with 15 students versus 30 students. I guess I'm going back to the teacher in me. It's, it's difficult to be as focused and effective when you have double the number of folks. So we build in quarterly follow-ups. We build in lab reviews where we can work on certain things um, and the doctors have the time to give that kind of focus to the patients and it it really is a lesson i learned um, between between companies that people seem to want the smaller practices uh, one of one of my offices i think had a dozen physicians that's a lot we're keeping this to three per office so that it feels more personal, so that everyone knows everyone when they come in and we're keeping the ratio lower uh, consciously. So Linda, and, and I know we have, we have a couple questions that we have um, given you know, more preparation for, but listening to your stories, I, I do have a couple of questions that I hope you don't mind me interjecting or, or asking sporadically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, I've known you for a long time, and I know that you are such an advocate for um, professional women. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so much being written about um, disparities, health disparities for women in particular. Um, could you talk a little bit about Welcome MD and focus on women? That is a really interesting question. We Ha women have a different, obviously, set of hormones. And one of the things that our doctors with their anti-aging um, backgrounds really understand are hormones. And so when, when important, when necessary, we look at that at a micro level to see about rhythms, stress levels, things about food that may pull us down, just the different things that women deal with. And we look a lot at sleep and stress. One of the first things our doctors ask is, how are you sleeping? And I don't, I know everyone has trouble sleeping, I think, especially during COVID, but mm -hmm. um, it's been shown that women tend to have more trouble sleeping, partly from hormones, partly from all the different things that pull us as 
business people and mothers and wives and community members. So we really try to focus on those things and also the mental health aspect of it and how happy are people and how balanced do they feel? And if they're struggling with that, what can we recommend? Because it's not just about the labs and the physical. Thank you, thank you. So what did you learn from Partner MD that you've brought over to Welcome? Well, one of the things I mentioned was the, the lower ratios, and mm -hmm. that was really, really helpful. I wanted to pull physicians that have a little different orientation. The doctors at Partner are superb, absolutely amazing physicians. But what I wanted was someone who maybe had a little bit more background in some other areas so we could give an even more holistic way of looking at things. Our, our third physician in Richmond has a medical acupuncture knowledge. He is, uh, has a sort of mind, body, spirit background. There's a lot of different things I'm looking for so that we can pull in even more expertise. And then the third thing, and this is really interesting to me, Partner MD, all the physicians are employed physicians. This time around, I wanted our physicians to have equity in the company. And it's really changed things. It's changed the dynamic. And they are even more connected, even more um, a part of the team. They, I consider them partners, not employees. And they give a lot of suggestions and help guide the growth of the practice. So that's been really fun for me to change up that dynamic. That's interesting. Are there other concierge uh, practices outside of this market do that? Is this a novel idea? They're all different. The biggest one in the country is called MDVIP, and it's like a franchise. A physician buys it, gets the training, and then converts his patients and can do really, really well. The problem with it is that if you don't convert enough patients out of the gate, MDVIP is not known for helping you continue to get patients. Whereas what we do is we constantly market, it, market, we do monthly events, we pull in speakers, doctors from different expertise, we get our, our physicians out as thought leaders. And so we're constantly attracting people who are seeking this type of holistic care versus getting the group right at first and then that's it. Right. So we, we are able to grow in a way that other folks in the industry aren't. That's really kind of our secret sauce, I think. Oh, fabulous. So if we can switch the topic a little bit, um, yeah, there's so much information out um, and so much different information out on COVID every single day. Mm -hmm. you know, I've gotten into the practice that at noontime, I'll turn on the TV and listen to the most recent update. And it's amazing how different it is from day to day and where people are going with all of this. So what I'm interested in is, is how has COVID-19 impacted your business, your clients and your employees? What, and, and what are you seeing? What is today's news? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I guess the biggest thing is that it's, it's really impacting everything all the time. I've, I've never seen anything like it in real time. It's not that the, the slide says, and I, I wrote the slide, it changed everything overnight. It changes everything hour by hour, yeah. half hour by half hour. And us being right on the front lines of it, we're seeing all kinds of different things. So, um, in terms of how it's impacted the business, obviously, maybe not obviously, but our revenues are down in terms of insurance because people are not as comfortable coming in. We still are open and we have people come in when it's necessary, but we're doing as much as we can by HIPAA protected telemedicine and that works well, but those revenues are down. Um, practice memberships, are holding steady. A lot of people seem to be joining because of the feeling of wanting this kind of connection 
in this crisis. I talked to a guy in Charlotte because he wanted to talk to the owner to see if we were really going to stick around. So I called him and I was happy to do it. And he said that his wife had been asking him to join a concierge for 10 years and he'd never gotten around to it. And he's had like two or three lung operations. And he said, and she said, well, I think now is the time. I think you really do need something other than the urgent care to <laughs> take yeah. care of you in this. And it really is a trigger for people to consider this because being able to call 24 seven email, um, come in if necessary, get on a visit for anything, for any question about yourself or your family is a big thing because the times are so uncertain. Um, we're seeing people joining their family members, their, their elderly parents, their kids who are home, even if it's just for a couple of months, just to have that reassurance that if something happens, we're there. Um, and then I guess the other thing is where I've really tried to focus on virtual touches because we can't touch people as much. So obviously telemedicine, our doctors just have taken to calling people. We've prioritized our elderly patients. We've prioritized our folks who need special um, help because of autoimmune or comorbidities, but we're trying to call everyone and just ask them, even if they're healthy, how are you feeling? Are you having any issues getting things? How is, this, how is your stress level? What can we do? Do you wanna come by and pick up supplements? We'll bring them out to the curb for you that may help with anxiety or whatever. So we're trying really, really hard to touch people. Each of our doctors in their own words wrote a really heartfelt letter to, to their patients and a couple of them almost made me cry. They were just so beautiful mm -hmm. in how they wanted to say from their heart how much they want to be there for the patients. And that has really, that really meant a lot to me. So we're doing a lot of that. Um, the other things, and we're getting so many questions all the time. It's absolutely crazy. But the other touch point that I want people to know in terms of business is I've tried to really focus on listening to the staff and my coworkers. And so if I'm on the phone and someone's voice is really tight or I ask them how they're doing and they're like, oh, okay, kind of thing. I'll follow up on it, I'll ask, and I'm trying to really be sensitive to all those cues that you don't get when, you get the cues when you're in a meeting, when you can look at people, when you can see how engaged they are, but if it's a phone or even a Zoom, it's harder, and so I'm really trying to do that, probe and then reassure, tell them that this will be over, we will get through this, we'll get through it together, we're just as strong as everyone in our company. And I think not being just focused on the business, but being more focused on that soft side is really helpful to people because even if they don't show it, everyone is under tremendous stress. We're all good at keeping our game face on, but this is uncharted territory. There's no doubt about it. Um, and then in terms of our more concrete response, we were among the first in Richmond to have the testing. We turned the testing around 90 plus percent of the time in 24 hours. And now we have antibody tests. And there are, there's controversy about how effective the mm -hmm. FDA is studying it now, but we have the tools. And if someone is identified, and we've had a couple patients identify positive, a few, then we can get them back and see when they have the antibody. So then they can start being in the world again. And um, the, the other focus is keeping patients out of the hospital because if possible, you do not wanna to go to the ER right now unless right. you really need it. So one small anecdote, we had a patient last week with a really bad dog bite and she called up and said, I'm gonna to go to the emergency room. And our doc said, no, 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 wait a minute come in here, we'll treat it, we'll disinfect it. And then we spent 
couple of hours calling around to people with specialties in this area, finding out what the person needed based on the history to make sure that that was taken care of without going to the emergency room. So we are trying to keep people out of the hospitals as much as we can, which I feel is really a service um, to everybody because the hospitals don't need the dog bites right now. Uh, I would agree 100%. So Linda, I know that you're a big planner. Um, you must have, how many iterations of contingency plans do you have set up at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, my CFO is wonderful and he helps me with this, but um, we have a few. We have a few. We have the one we're under now, which is good, but then we have a next case and a next case. We could probably do more, but I think that would fry our brains. So I don't <laughs> think we could do that. Um, okay. But yeah, it's really, really important. So you talked a little bit, and I'll come back to a follow-up on, uh, you were talking about the high-touch environment, both with your, um, your patients, your clients, as well as with your employees. How are your employees doing with all of this as the front line? I think they're doing remarkably well. We put something out on one of our communications, my wonderful practice manager's idea of having everyone with their masks and gloves and their kind of hazard suits out in front of the office getting a picture. Um, but they really do take care of each other. After we had our first patient, positive patient and we realized quite a bit of the office was exposed, we, um, not me because I was working at home, but the people at the clinic were all tested. They all had a great attitude. Everyone tested negative and they're constantly adding to the new things that we do in terms of screening people at the curb, in terms of asking questions before people come in, triaging, making sure that we're safe, but also giving people the touch they need because it's always easy to say, oh no, we won't see you. We just have to make the best clinical decision and be there as much as possible for our patients. So Linda, as, as a bus businesswoman in today's environment, mm -hmm. what are the biggest challenges that you are personally facing? Well, <laughs> I think the biggest one we kind of alluded to is the constant change and the constant stress. Um, business has always changed, business is always stressed, but it's fun and dynamic. In this, it's kind of like one of those video games where asteroids are coming at you and you have to kind of duck from all the asteroids as, as you shift from one thing, then some meteor comes hurtling by at, for another thing. So it's almost like, which is a terrible thing to me, I'm being very honest, it's almost like it's a survival of the fittest environment. And I'll give you an example that I think you know about when I start this, um, when all the SBA loans came out, the Paycheck mm -hmm. Protection, we were the first to be on the website of our bank to ask for conference calls to say, help us, we have all the details, we got a team together, we worked day and night to put it in place, but sadly, our bank just couldn't really rise to the occasion and you know, through no fault of their own. It's all new to everybody. I'm not pointing any fingers here, but it became clear I had a, I have a pretty trusted person in the bank. And she basically said to me, if you can go to a different bank, you should, because I'm really afraid you're not going to get this. And you have too many people that depend on you. So I started networking and one of the people I thought of was my friend Gail. And she was able to connect me with a bank that she sits on the board of and they were incredible and we were able to to go ahead and successfully complete the documents and and receive that loan but it the part that bothers me about it is that not everybody has a friend like Gail or other people that I called not so many people are this connected and so, for example, my son in California started at the beginning. He has a nonprofit. He's with Bank of America. He didn't have a credit lending. 
he didn't get it this time around and he's hanging on by a thread. And that's the hard part. That's why I'm saying it's so hard, but you have to think out of the box. You can't just follow um, sort of reassurances. You have to think, what if this doesn't happen? What can I do to position myself so that I really am doing the best for my company? Um, in the middle of it, before I called Gail the night before, I was talking to my husband and I actually started tearing up and I just basically said, I'm trying so hard. My CFO and I, he's an investor as well, we are trying so hard to get this help and I feel so ineffectual and I'm not used to feeling ineffectual. I feel usually I have a plan and I just was hitting my head against a wall and it, it, I just felt kind of emotional about it. And sure enough, that kind of epiphany then allowed me to say, well, okay, going this route is not working. What do I need to do next to run parallel tracks to try to get something moving here? And that, that was a, a big aha for me because again, you, you, you don't have, you don't go to school for this. You just don't know how to do that. Um, yeah. So I get, go ahead. I was going to say, if I can add one thing for, for people who are on the phone, because I've been watching emails on this, and I think for anybody who knows me knows that I was a banker for 35 years, and, and I will always probably be a banker um, and, and think so, so highly of the system and, and believe that you know, the, the, the health of our nation rests on having a healthy banking system. Um, I've seen so many emails, or not emails, but uh, posts on, on Facebook about people who are... Um, damning the banking system right now mm -hmm. um, for not being able to meet needs. And Linda, the way that you had just described that situation and you were very, very gracious with the institution that you were with where you were asking for help and weren't able to get it, understanding that this was a new program and there were lots of glitches. Yeah, um, tremendous. So I'm just gonna make an appeal to everybody on the phone. Don't give up on the banking system and, and, and understand that not all banks are the equal. And, and um, I was, I'm very proud of, of the, the bank that I sit on the board of and was very proud that to learn that every one of our clients who had applied and met the requirements uh, actually were, uh, were funded, which is not the case uh, in all cases. Um, but it did differ from, from bank to bank. Um, I will say that community banks um, were a little bit more nimble mm -hmm. than the large institutions. Um, but that's only because of the size and, and trying to cram all that information down with the magnitude of volume that was coming from those large institutions. Um, I do understand that there's another bill coming out. It's probably going to be a little bit um, bill of difference. So the people who applied for the first round that didn't get in, um, it's, it, you know, they'll have to reapply um, and, and hopefully things will go their way. But um, you were just so gracious in understanding that it's easy to work with somebody like you who understands because of your business background. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you recognize that things can be challenging, particularly when they're a new program. So, so I enjoyed working with you on that and I'm glad it all worked out. Other challenges that you can think we of? We made a real point afterwards to thank everyone from the CEO to the loan officers, to the people. That's another thing in this environment yeah. You can't move so fast, you forget to thank people. And, and that meant a lot to them. So kudos to everyone at Essex Bank. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank I'll you. mention it. <laughs> <laughs> um, other challenges from a, a business perspective, and particularly as a, a bus anything from a perspective of the woman, the businesswoman's hat? Well, um, I just feel like decisions need to be made with a different filter now. It's sort of like when I'm looking at a decision, it's not just do I need to spend this money or hire this person or make this change. It's like you have to think 10 steps down and think about all your contingency plans before you make a decision. But you have to make decisions. You can't let it, it completely paralyze you. So I'm always thinking about what can I do to keep things stable, to keep the business 
as vibrant as it is to keep the spirit of it and the culture of it together. And I just feel like all of our businesses will change after this. I mean, one positive for us is we're thinking more, and we were doing it before, but it sort of forced us into it. We're thinking more about virtual memberships and folks who are in Virginia, but out in the rural areas and don't have access to this and can come in once a year for a thorough workup and do everything else by telemedicine mm -hmm. or come in. But things that sort of work more in a virtual environment. And I think all of our businesses and all of our lives are gonna be changed after this, that now that we're thinking about different ways to reach each other. Um, another thing that we're doing, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are doing it, but I wanna mention it, we're, we're developing COVID KPIs. And so things like How's our insurance revenue doing? How many visits are we having? How many of our members are calling saying, I don't know if I can keep paying this because I own a gymnasium and I have no income. How many new members are we getting? All those different things. And we're looking at it on a weekly basis so that again, we can really evaluate things um, and cash balances and then I don't know if this is uniquely female, I'm sure it isn't, but I've always been very humbled and grateful for our customers. And so in this time, I'm trying more than ever to treat them as absolutely golden. So in 2008, 2009 at Partner MD, we had people, especially in the real estate and construction business that just couldn't pay for their memberships. I asked every one of those to talk to me or to be presented to me. And we worked with them. We said, we know you're up for it. Just, you know, take a deep breath and we'll, we'll give you some time. And our retention rate did not go down even 1% during that time. Now, this is not 2009, believe me. This is very, very different, but it's the same principle of giving people a lot of grace and trying to understand their situation while still trying to run your business. So it's how kind are you to how many people for how long and how does it work? And so um, I struggle with that, but I hear examples through the grapevine, like a big hospital system in Richmond that sent an email to 700 employees the night before saying, do not come to work kind of thing. What we're trying to do is the opposite of that to if someone reaches out to us to talk to them to work with them to find a humanitarian way to deal with this situation because we're totally all in it together um so that's that's one of the things and then i guess the last thing that you alluded to is just to run multiple scenarios um, it's really important and, and I put on the slide, have the stomach to run them because mm -hmm. as entrepreneurs, we love running these scenarios about, wow, I'm gonna introduce this new, new line or this new doctor or this new thing. And, and then we look at all the great positive effects on the p and and we all feel so good. The, this is the opposite of that. This is what happens if we have multiple waves of this and next winter and next fall we're shut down again and how do we survive this and how do we look at things and that takes a discipline and and really an iron <laughs> constitution because it is not easy so i just really encourage people to do it or to get a good consultant to help you do it i mean whatever it takes, but have somebody in there getting your head around multiple realities that could happen with this. Well, fa fabulous. So changing the topic just a little bit, mm -hmm. um, women accounted for 60% of all job losses in the month of March. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for professional women on how to survive these turbulent waters? Well, I have, I've thought about this. That was a great question. And I've got a few things. 
<coughs> excuse me. Um, one is you've got to be really nimble. So one example is my personal trainer who I love and is very responsible for keeping me as fit as I am, whatever, whatever level that is, it's the best I can do. And most of her clients dried up after, during this time, but she has enough other things that she's willing to do that she is doing okay. So she knows people that do Airbnbs that aren't rented out. So she's helping refurnish them and mount things and clean them. She is doing people's books. She is helping with other things with clients that she can do virtually. I mean, she's not just sitting there going, oh no, I have no clients, I have nothing to do, how am I gonna feed my family? She's really figuring it out. Right. Um, I guess the next thing I, I thought of is that a lot of people aren't working as much. Some people aren't working at all, as you alluded to. And so my thought there is, try to use the time. I do consulting on the side, I love it. And usually with women um, entrepreneurs, sometimes I invest in their companies. It's very exciting and fun for me to see these incredible businessmen and women out there who the younger generation starting things and I try to help them figure it out. But I had one person approach me just last week who I've known for a couple of years. And she said, I am using this time to really reevaluate my goals, my business, the things that I want out of this. And I would love to start working with you. I've not had the time, but if you can spare the time, I really want to focus on this in this time, I want to use it to its maximum. So I thought that was pretty inspirational mm -hmm. to think about, about doing that because we are, all of us, no matter how much we feel like we're not, we're on a hamster wheel. I mean, we're always responding, reacting, meeting, going here, going there. We're just as busy, many of us now, but it's a different kind of busy. And I think we're more able to think about what is really important and Put especially those those of the listeners out there who aren't um, working, they can take the time to really think about, do they want to go back and do the same thing? Do they want to do something different? How does this work? And then the last thing is just reinventing your goals. So maybe if your goal was to be the world's greatest salesperson and you're in an organization where at the moment there's nothing to sell, what are your key competencies? What do you really love doing? Is it really selling or is it maybe coaching or helping other people to achieve their potential or what are different things? Do a giant whiteboard in your house or your mind of, what are other goals that you would like if this particular goal you've been charging after is not accessible anymore because of the economy or anymore for a while? I remember in 2008 and nine, there were articles about people at big corporations who were laid off and they started their own companies and they were happier than they'd ever been. And that's not everybody, but you can make this into a tragedy, which it is for many people. I'm not minimizing that. Or you can take what time you have and try to try to make the best out of the situation and position yourself to come out of this better than when you went in, which I know is tough, but. <laughs> but I think it's, I think there, there's a great pieces of advice. So thank you very much. Linda, anything else that you'd like to share with the audience today? Any other words of wisdom on navigating today uh, or just some personal thoughts? Um, I guess the only thing I just want to say is this is really hard. I mean, I'll be very honest. I, I read an article about people's dreams and I have COVID dreams, just really strange, surreal ones. Some are funny, some are strange, but it's obviously in all our consciences. And there are things that 
we can all keep in touch by Zoom and have our Zoom games and our Zoom cocktails, but it's very different when you can't touch people and hug them and be with them. And I think it takes its toll and we have to really realize how we're feeling and our stress levels so that we don't get depleted by this because we have to save our energy for the long haul. This might be a long situation and we've, we've got to sort of do the, the marathon versus the sprint back to the DNA and try to, try to get, get to the end uh, in the best way we can. Well, thank, thank you so much. Um, if anyone has any questions, we'd love to have them. Let me see. Does anybody have any questions? That's interesting. My last one, I had a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I am not seeing any questions. Um, but Linda, you know, your insights, uh, your thoughts, um, the sharing of your story uh, is much appreciated by me and I am sure by all of our, of our listeners. Um, this, these are unusual times, but I think staying positive as you are, um, being nimble, being able to let's see, just want you to know, oh, there's a comment here. Uh, somebody saying, Linda, I just want you to know how inspiring you are. Someone just raised their hand. Let me see. Um, and another person saying, thank you. This has been a wonderful hour. So I think a lot of appreciation, Linda, for your time with us today. Um, next week, we, on April 22nd, we're going to host a panel discussion on retail relief, um, talking about federal programs that are providing assistance and how retailers are using um, or are adjusting their strategies to um, be successful, to continue to be successful. Uh, joining us is going to be Nancy Thomas, who is president and CEO of Retail Merchants Association, uh, along with Diana Kent, who is marketing and membership manager for the Retail um, Merchants Association. If anybody is in the Richmond market, you might be following, uh, RMA is doing some incredible work um, in, um, in putting out new programs and helping the retailers and the small businesses in our market. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And we're going to feature a small business owner by the name of Sarah Nicholas, who owns a uh, boutique called Ladles and Linens. Actually, there are three locations that she has. It's a boutique store that specializes in all things cooking, baking, and entertaining. <laughs> and um, Nancy has kind of held her out as the, the model of um, adaptability and nimbleness. So I hope that you'll be joining us uh, next week as well to everybody on the phone. I want to say thank you oh, to everybody. Can I interrupt? We did get a question. Is it too okay. to answer? Sure. I'll read it. I All right. It says, um, I really look up to you. What advice would you give a potential female entrepreneur at age 50 who wants a wellness holistic company? So <laughs> can I take that before we start? Sure can. Thank you. So I would say now is the time to focus on wellness. I think we are I mean, just looking at the lack of pollution because of the cars that aren't on the road, it shows what can happen when people work together to do something. And I don't think this is going anywhere in terms of wellness. I think people need it. They want it. And you need a plan. You need a focus and you need your own unique view of how you can contribute because wellness is a word that is very broad and very kind of bandied about, but it's real if you can connect with people in a specific focused way. And I applaud that because what, what better way to feel good about what you're doing? And I happen to know you and I would be happy to talk to you offline, over coffee, out of the office um, to help you with this. So thank you for that question. All right, any other questions? All right, so I wanna just say again, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I hope you'll join us next week 
Um, but until then, stay healthy and stay safe. Thanks so much. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Exhausted? A little bit. It's great. Thank you. I wish you would see my other one too. It's so good at this. Did I do well? Yeah. I didn't pontificate too much. No, I mean, you're so genuine and so warm. Mm -hmm. People really like